Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the special services on this great day of uh, Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpets. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the time when we uh, pause for reflection upon what God's doing. Uh, we observe his calendar. In fact, we're kind of dual calendar people, aren't we? Uh, we um, have a foot in the world with the Roman calendar and all those holidays and affairs and everything else. We just completed Labor Day weekend. Uh, but also we are mindful that that's not the whole story. God has his own calendar. It's a loony solar calendar. It operates with a moon cycle corrected with a solar cycle. And so its months are a little different. And uh, when it comes around to the seventh month of the seventh moon, of the Hebrew calendar, which is today, by the way. This is what's called, um, in uh, lunar uh, calendrical terms, the uh, Molot of Tishri. Uh, the month Tishri is the seventh month, and this is the new moon of Tishri, the beginning. And it's called also the head of the year. That's what Rosh Hashanah. Uh, means the beginning or the head uh, of the year. Uh, we commonly call it the Feast of Trumpets, which is maybe a little bit more descriptive of what might take place on this day, because it was a day of the blowing of trumpets, which generally signifies something, something big deal uh, that's happening, and it's symbolic, but it's also prophetic. And we find in the great prophetic book of Revelation, lots of trumpets. And of course, there were lots of trumpets back in the Old Testament blown uh, at the uh, temple. Uh, many of them, of course, we call trumpets. They would be shofars or ram's horns uh, that were blown. And they signified uh, something uh, that was going to happen, an occurrence, an event. Uh, a time movement uh, to get one's attention. And so we get the attention now of of God uh, by celebrating the, this day with him, uh, this day of trumpets, to find out, well, what's special about it? What can we learn about it? And so we take our one foot out of the... Uh, calendar world of the Gregorian calendar and the Julian calendar whatever calendar uh, people are attuned to, uh, the Jewish calendar which of course has the holy days uh, involved in it and uh, ask about God what what is his time schedule, what is he doing, what are his plans now we hear a lot about Jesus coming back at the last trumpet the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. So we, we, we sing these songs, but are they rooted in some reality, some meaning? Is there a prophetic truism? Is there an ultimate happening that is pictured by these uh, days? Well, I believe there is. And uh, this is a particularly uh, happy day, I think. It's... Uh, maybe a mixed day in that it's a time of judgment 
but the judgment at the other end of it is of, of sunshine, of happiness and joy, for the kingdom comes. Rejoice, for your Redeemer liveth. And it is a time when we can rejoice, and Christians have more reason than anybody else on the face of the earth to be true optimists. And this day of, of trumpets is a day of, of that optimism, where we can revel in some of that. Knowing that God is going to settle all accounts, he's going to straighten things out. That's an optimistic viewpoint, isn't it? If you uh, watch the nightly news, you say, what a mess. The Middle East never is it going to be straightened out. And so you about ready to throw your hands up and say, you know, forget about it. This world's going down the tubes. Uh, it's irredeemable. It's unfixable. And uh, th th that's a pessimistic uh, viewpoint, but it's a realistic one given the factors on the ground. But the factors all aren't on the ground, are they? Uh, the big factor is in heaven. That's God himself who rules supreme, who has a plan. And that plan's ticking along. Tick, tick, tick. Unstoppable. And it's moving to a climax. And that plan, if we want to see its way marks, is illustrated by the, the holy days in the calendar of God. What foresight, what thought God must have put into the construction of the uh, calendar. We talk about intelligent design in nature. Well, there's intelligent design in the cosmos, in time itself, in planning, and, uh, and God's the author of, of it all. So we're seeing just a little of that intelligence, and I hope it's enough to cause us to have a certain amount of awe and respect and not trudge into these annual days saying, oh, well, another Holy Day season, another Feast of Trumpets, another uh, Day of Atonement, another Feast of Tabernacles. Like We've got kind of a routine, you know. There's nothing routine about God in that he's doing things new and fresh. And he's leading us in a direction that is uh, totally uh, stupendous and marvelous. And it, it should be jaw-dropping for us to really consider. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit more, I'm sure, today. Anyway, first I want to uh, thank uh, Al Murray for taking the virtual church program last week on a phone-only service. Um, and uh, for his wife, Deb. And uh, they were speaking to us from Idaho. And it was very uh, good of them to uh, to do that. I enjoyed the visit. Joanne and I went to see our daughter in Spokane. Had a delightful time over there seeing them. And uh, it was good to have a, have a break away for a weekend. And I want to thank uh, the Murrays for allowing us to do that. But here we're back with live streaming, and we have a special guest speaker today, uh, all the way from um, Oxford, Ohio, uh, where the University of Miami is located. He's a professor of mathematics, Dr. Doug Ward. You've heard from him for years on the annual Holy Days and uh, some other occasions. Uh, always a deep, uh, good, solid biblical material. It's like a steak on a plate, well done just right uh, that you can cut into and, and have some meat to chew on and we're looking forward to hearing from Doug here in a few minutes uh, but before we begin we're going to ask God's uh, blessing as we dedicate this time to him and ask for his inspiration and guidance so join me as we pray loving father you are our God and we are your people we are willing and anxious to be instructed by you. We want to hear your word. Give us open minds to hear, then to apply, and then to share the good things that you give us. Help us, Father, to follow the example of your Son at your side, Jesus, the Beloved One, the Son in whom you're well pleased. For he, he dwelt on your will and followed your will with every ounce of energy he had in him to his dying breath here on this earth and then was resurrected and glorified and is at your side 
soon to administer your kingdom on this earth. Father, we ask that you would inspire us to follow in the footsteps of your Son. Help us to better understand this day of Rosh Hashanah. Understand the meaning of your plan and how we can fit into it and how we can be prepared and how we can move Godward in heart and character and mind and humility and goodness. Bless us now, inspire Dr. Ward, inspire the speaking, and inspire everybody that's listening today. And we thank you for this opportunity and for this blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know if you uh, heard about it, but the Christian Broadcasting Network, CBN, had a special last night. I got several emails uh, regarding it, and I was going to uh, watch it myself, but uh, we had company, and we're not able to uh, to do it. But uh, they have, um, and they've done this, I think, for a couple of years now, but they had a special uh, Rosh Hashanah service uh, last night. Now, CBN is the biggest thing in Protestant uh, uh, television. And that's Pat Robertson's organization. They've got a, you know, their own college and broadcast studios and news operation and everything else. And, and they've really gotten into the annual festivals. Who would have believed this years ago? Uh, when you could have talked to any of the people involved in CBN, you know, 15, 20 years ago and talked to them about the annual festivals of God, they would, have, you know, wrinkle up their nose and looked at you askance like you had gone over the deep end or become some reprobate Jew or some uh, thing like that. And here they are, they're seeing the value of it. I mean, really seeing the value of it and putting on an entire production of uh, song and message and uh, about the meaning of, of this day of Feast of Trumpets. So uh, I commend them for that, and I think it's uh, good. It's nice to see that beginning to uh, work its way now into the Christian world. So it isn't just a few um, oddballs out there, so to speak, that are uh, celebrating the annual festivals of God. But it's becoming more and more uh, mainstream, and I hope that uh, that trend continues. I think it's very important that it do, uh, that it does continue. Well, Doug, you've got a topic for us today, and uh, what was that title again? Okay, so uh, my title is uh, Kings in Israel, an Accommodation or God's Intention? Well, you know, sure. Don't we know that that was uh, just an accommodation because they're all rotten, all those Israelites, and they just wanted a king, and uh, so... Uh, he just accommodated them, and uh, he couldn't have had any intention to do that. Isn't that the standard understanding of that uh, uh, situation? Uh, well, it's it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a topic that's uh, you know <laughs> been a, the subject of uh, lots and lots of discussion. So, yeah. uh, and I'm not going to say anything new about it, certainly. But uh, well, you know, feel um, feel free if you. Got... It, it always generates discussion, and, and I know um, um, our Bible study group uh, was been going through the Pentateuch this year, and we hit that part of Deuteronomy a few weeks ago, and uh, it generated some nice discussion, and so I thought I'd, I'd share some of it. Yeah, I've always wondered about uh, that. I, you know, you see, you can see both sides of it, actually. Um, and, well, I'm sure you get into that. I, I don't want to speculate. I'll, I'll ask my questions later on, but uh, you can kind of see both sides uh, of it, and I'm looking forward to what you've got to say about it. So, uh, for and this is very important as far as the history of Israel. We got whole books entitled uh, "Kings and the Chronicles of the Kings," and uh, much of the history of the nation of Israel is wound around uh, this very subject. So, uh, for our first message today, Doctor Doug Ward. Thanks, Ken, and it's a delight to to be with you again and to uh, uh, be together with them virtual church community again celebrating the holy days uh, amen to what Ken is saying about the increased interest and awareness in the, in the festival days it's a, a very good thing and as Ken has been saying kind of anticipating
heading where I'm uh, heading. Of course, this is the time when we think about the uh, return of Jesus as King of Kings. And in general, the kingship of God is a, a, certainly a major theme in the Bible that's associated with this festival. God's kingship is certainly emphasized throughout the Bible. One um, fun trivia question is, where is the first place in the Bible where you read about God being king? <laughs> and I think the answer is in, um, in Exodus 15, 18, in the, in the Song of the Sea, where, uh, where it says, The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Now, because ancient Israel had God as king, ultimately, they didn't necessarily require a human king, but certainly they um, were allowed to have a king, as specified in Deuteronomy 17. And that's where I'm going to start, in Deuteronomy 17, and verses 14 and 15. I've got a couple copies of the New International Version sitting on my computer screen and all chewed up to Deuteronomy 17. And remember, in, in this part of Deuteronomy, Moses is um, telling the Israelites shortly before they're going to enter the land of Canaan and shortly before his death all the things that they're going to need to know to be successful in the land. Um, and the whole section between Deuteronomy chapter 12 and, and 26, it's a, a listing of commandments. Um, certainly doesn't seem to be a random list. They seem to be organized according to which of the Ten Commandments they're associated with. That's not a, a hard and fast rule, but that's a good, a good rough outline. And in Deuteronomy 16 through 18, there's a, quite a bit of discussion of the governmental structure of Israel on different offices like judges and, and priests and kings. And in Deuteronomy 17, 14, Moses tells the people, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. So we see that um, uh, this isn't requiring Israel to have a king. And of course, historically, it was a few hundred years after um, Israel arrived, arrived in the Promised Land uh, to the time when they, uh, they asked for a king. But uh, they're certainly allowed to have a king, and uh, God specifies here that this king should be someone who ch is chosen by God and is an Israelite. Now, um, a question that, uh, that then arises is, what's, what is God's ultimate intention? Is a king something that uh, God is... Um, willing to, to put up with or is a king something that God intends Israel to, to have eventually and of course one reason that this question 
lives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. All right, so let's think about these uh, details for a minute. It was, uh, of course, typical for kings to uh, try and put together uh, large armies and accumulate wealth. And this was all part of the uh, acquiring great numbers of horses and large amounts of silver and gold. Of course, um, a king who uh, concentrated on those things would be likely to begin to think that he was supremely powerful and answerable to nobody. And also likely to think that the nation existed uh, for his sake rather than the other way around. And so such a king might do something like uh, sell some, uh, some of his citizens to Pharaoh in exchange for horses, as it's uh, uh, suggesting here. So we can see why, uh, why this um, specification has, has been made. We know uh, about the wisdom of that we must not take many wives. We, saw, we know about the problems that Solomon ran into uh, several hundred years after this. So these are uh, some things that uh, the king should not be. What should the king be? Well, if we go on in verses 18 and on. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the priests who were Levites. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God, and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees, and not consider himself better than his brothers, and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. So what's described here really indeed is a kind of king that is definitely not like the ones that the nations uh, around them would have. Uh, this king was somebody who was to really lead uh, the people in following the commandments of God. So here... The dynamic isn't that the, you've got a supremely powerful uh, king who's answerable to no one and uh, uh, feels that the, his citizens are there for his sake, but instead uh, what's described here is really a servant leader. And, the, of course, the ultimate authority is God the king and uh, ruling through the commandments of God uh, in other words, the rule of law, not the rule uh, of a human king. Very different from the other kind of king that uh, we know uh, was very prevalent in history, thinking back to uh, the Pharaoh of the Exodus or Roman empires. Uh, we know this is an issue right up into modern times with people like Hitler and Stalin and Mao, when you have people who decide that they're God and that they're the supreme authority, then they can do, of course, a tremendous amount of harm, while a king of this kind, someone who would lead the people in following the commandments and sticking with the covenant, uh, was an entirely different kind of king. And notice it says, then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. In verse 20. Um, and actually, if you're thinking about um, uh, the Ten Commandments as kind of a, an outline for Deuteronomy, uh, this part of Deuteronomy, um, which talks about leadership in Israel, really is, is you can think of as linked to the, the Fifth Commandment. Uh, the government is kind of an extension of the family structure. Uh, with a strong family structure, uh, Israel would, would uh, uh, live a long time in the land. That's the promise that goes with, uh, with the Fifth Commandment. And the same uh, promise goes with, uh, uh, with a good leader who would uh, encourage the people 
nine years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I'm God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I'll confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You'll be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Avraham, for I've made you a father of many nations. I'll make you very fruitful. I'll make nations of you, and kings will come from you. So the plan here is, as part of the, the blessing that comes with this promise, there would be kings who would be descendants of Abraham. Of course, uh, as forerunners of the ultimate king, the Messiah. And that promise is repeated. We know as we go uh, through the book of Genesis. A few verses later, um, verse 15 in chapter 17, God also said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, uh, you're no longer to call her Sarah. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I'll bless her so that she'll be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. And so again, um, they're, uh, having kings as descendants is part of God's plan for Abraham. That promise is affirmed, repeated, as we go on uh, through the book of Genesis. Uh, for example, it's repeated to Jacob in Genesis 35. Genesis 35, verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel, and let's see if I got the right verse here. Yeah, verse 11, I guess. Let's go to there. Yeah. And God said to him, I'm God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. So again, this affirmation that uh, there would be uh, kings who would be descendants of Jacob, leading up to, of course, an, an ultimate king, the Messiah. Uh, that promise is continued through the tribe of Judah. When we get to the end of the book of Genesis, Jacob, in his blessing of the different tribes, remember the blessing to Judah in Genesis 49, and I'm thinking in particular about verse 10 of chapter 49. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs. And the obedience of the nations is his. So again, uh, there would be a, a kings who would come from the tribe of Judah, uh, up until the time when, till he comes to whom it belongs, the ultimate king, the Messiah. It is uh, proclaimed throughout the scriptures. So that would suggest that it, it is God's intention that Israel would, um, and uh, at the right time, have a king. Another thing to, to keep in mind as we think about how history progressed is to think about the history recorded in the book of Judges. We know that in, in that period of history, Israel really descended into lawlessness and, and in some cases anarchy and, and in some instances there were sins that were like those of Sodom and Gomorrah. So remember what the book of Judges says right at the end, the very last verse of the book of Judges, Judges 21-25. Let's go there for a brief review. All right. Yeah, and uh, of course in, uh, in the NIV it says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Or in the familiar words of the King James, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, of course, Israel's biggest problem was uh, was in rejecting the rulership of God, their, their ultimate king. But I think there is some suggestion in Judges that Israel at this point could use a, a Deuteronomy 17 type king to lead them in following the, the ways of God uh, because of the anarchy that they'd fallen into. Uh, another thing to, to think about then is thinking more about the history of Israel. A lot of Israel's high 
points as a nation came under the kings who came the closest to the ideal of, of Deuteronomy 17. David, of course, was the, the one who wrote uh, Psalm 1 and Psalm 19 and Psalm 119 uh, was someone who immersed himself in God's word, meditating on it day and night. And rather than hold himself to be the uh, the absolute authority, he trusted in God. Uh, let's think for example about uh, one instance where we see the way that that David operated. Uh, let's go to First Samuel. Let's go to uh, let's go to Second Samuel five. when 
commandments were and uh, setting himself to lead the people and walking according to them. So again, Josiah was a, a very much a Deuteronomy 17 kind of king. dynamic that 
himself up as uh, uh, as a competitor to God, as uh, as in the other nations where you have kings who decide that they're God. So I think with a, a close look at, at First uh, Samuel eight um, solves the uh, solves the issue, or at least one way to solve the issue. And, and, uh, looking at all the scriptures together is uh, is to note that the issue isn't so much whether they should have a king but what kind of king they should have and so that's where I come down on this question of good God intent for Israel to have a king it's uh, uh, an issue that, that uh, has been much discussed it's interesting to read about what Jewish tradition has to say and I was reading about that a few weeks ago in fact, in um, in the Talmud, in the Babylonian Talmud, and this is from Tractate Sanhedrin, uh, page 20b, asked about uh, this whole issue of a king. And one authority, Rabbi Judah, says that um, he said there were three things that uh, for Israel to fulfill when they reached the land. Uh, one was to appoint a king. Uh, second is to... Uh, destroy Amalek, and the third is to build a temple. And apparently, in, in his view, uh, Israel really needed to, to have, a, have a king and have that kind of structure before they would really uh, be able to, to, um, uh, to take care of the Amalekites and to, and to build a temple. And on the other hand, there, were, there was uh, another sage, Rabbi Nohorai, who, who said, no, this was, uh, this was an accommodation to the murmurings of the people. The, um, the weight of, of Jewish tradition ends up falling with, uh, with Rabbi Judah. And actually, in the, in the Middle Ages, when uh, Maimonides came up with his famous list of 613 commandments, enumerating the commandments in the Pentateuch, uh, he has appointing a, a king as one of the 613 commandments, meaning that this was something that they were supposed to, uh, uh, supposed to eventually do when the time was right. Now, this is a, a politically loaded subject, because, of course, is another reason that, uh, uh, that it's interesting, is because when we talk about it in the background, we've got questions, our, we've got political science questions in our minds. And um, so I should make clear what I'm not saying here. I'm not saying here that uh, monarchy is necessarily the ideal form of, of human government. There are a number of possible governmental structures and I think how well they work uh, depends on how well uh, that particular group of people follows the ways of God, right? whatever kind of uh, whatever kind of structure that they have. And it uh, it may be that uh, you know in a in some alternate uh, universe, if uh, 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 you know maybe it's some different form of government would have been. Uh, 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 would have been called for, but but uh, um, the point is the uh, the what you really have is the rule ultimately of God and the rule of law. Those are the those are the essential things. I'm also uh, not saying that uh, the best kind of a church government is a, a highly centralized one. Again, uh, different structures are are possible, and the key thing is that the people involved are uh, submitted to God, uh, and that the leaders are are servant leaders who are following the spirit of what's laid out in in, uh, in the scriptures, including Deuteronomy 17. So on this um, on this feast of trumpets. Um, this is a time to, uh, when we think about uh, God as our king, um, it's a time when we submit ourselves uh, to God, our Father, and our King, uh, and seek to follow Jesus, the Messiah, who, uh, who, was our, uh, who was our king. And of 
Well, thanks. Um, thanks, Doug. Get my mic back going here. And uh, well, that was good. That was a real nice tour through the subject, and it certainly clarified things for for me. I mean, it made it all the more clear. Uh, the king can't be in competition with God as long as he's complimenting uh, the rule of God. Why, there's nothing in the world wrong with uh, having a king. But uh, that's, of course, um, a difficult dance for a lot of humans to uh, to handle. That's why they, uh, uh, English law and the rest, they had this battle all the time. You know, is the king the final arbiter of everything? Or is the king himself subject to God, to a higher authority? And uh, they basically concluded that it was uh, lex rex, the lex being law, and then law, that is the law of God, or law of nature, you might say, law of the universe, uh, is above the king. So it's lex rex, lex over rex, the king. Whereas most have operated the other way around. It's been Rex Lex. That is, the king makes the law. He's above the law. He can do whatever he wants. He is God. And there, of course, we have our terrible, terrible problems. And uh, we see that manifest all over in our world today. We could name names of people who operate uh, such. So God dealt in the real world, set parameters of the kind of king to choose, and gave guidance and uh, did all that he could to help Israel make smart smart choices. And uh, sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. And we know the rest of the this, this story. <coughs> well, thanks, Doug. Appreciate uh, that uh, message. It was, it was good. A couple of quick announcements here. Um, uh, last week, uh, we had asked you would be praying for... Uh, Lana Jane uh, uh, Bryant uh, uh, Lana Jane Bryant she is uh, the wife of uh, Roger Bryant who uh, sings and I'm going to have him sing a song here for us today here on, on the disc and uh, she was very very sick and she did die this last week so I ask your prayers for for her family, for uh, Roger, and for the children, for the loved ones. It was uh, very quick. And um, fine lady, and uh, she'll be waiting the, the trumpet call uh, with the rest of the, the righteous. And uh, But be praying for those that are suffering right now to be comforted uh, with the great comforter uh, who can give us that uh, that saw us to know that there is hope. There is a future. And I'm going to have, uh, we're going to close with a song from Roger Bryant. And uh, Lina Jane's going to be playing the piano. So it's an amazing thing with the recordings, you know, even after you're no longer here with us, uh, you still uh, are able to be heard and remembered. And the, the song I've chosen is from Felix Mendelssohn. Then shall the righteous shine forth from the uh, Elijah uh, by Felix Mendelssohn. So we'll have that uh, when we conclude our program today. But uh, We mailed the latest uh, newsletter here this last week. Um, hold up a copy here for you, those of you that uh, are watching on the, the web. Try to get this out a little bit more regularly here. Uh, I've got an article entitled The Big Hustle. Brian Knowles' fine article entitled um, um, Why the Gospel. There's got to be a why. Uh, form with, uh, with letters. And um, then we have... Um, an article by Dr. Doug Ward, uh, What Happened to Paul After Acts 28? And um, then Keeping Watch, I discussed the um, Duck Dynasty, the Scottish Solution, uh, the eruptions in Egypt, uh, Lincoln, 
President Lincoln and his troubles with Egypt, and he had them too. And uh, then some things on um, on prophecy as far as predicting the uh, end uh, biblical chronology you'll be interested in. And then Noel Root has an article entitled The Three Religions uh, in this particular uh, issue here as well as some... Uh, some humor. So that'll be, if you're in our mailing list, it'll be in the mail. It's already in the mail. And um, if you're not, just uh, drop us a line. Our address is there at our website, and we'd be happy to put you on a mailing list or receive this. And we want to get a copy of the um, New Millennium published before the uh, year is out as well. Got so many articles to put in it, and I just have to do it. Uh, the Day of Atonement is the next uh, holy day on the calendar, the next uh, festival, uh, not exactly a festival as far as the practical part of it, that is it's a fast day traditionally, uh, Yom Kippur, a uh, day of covering, and it's 10 days from now, and it'll be on Saturday this year, it falls on a Saturday, a week from this coming Saturday, so it'll be a, a, a double Sabbath as they say, weekly Sabbath and also uh, a holy day so that's a week from this sabbath will be the day of atonement and uh, we'll be celebrating it as uh, at our usual time here on the virtual church and then the feast of tabernacles uh, the following thursday uh, with it's a thursday to thursday affair this year so we'll have services on the first and the last day uh, the last great day of the feast, which is right at the end of the Feast Tabernacles. And a couple of days in between, we'll post them on our website. And we have a guest speaker, too, that's going to be joining us. So uh, look forward to that uh, as well. Well, those are all the announcements I have right now. And we've got a few minutes here for um, my shorter message uh, today, <clears throat> which I've en entitled... Uh, your first day in the new job in the kingdom of God. And I won't get into the details of the, the job or speculate on that too too much, but just the anticipation of the first day uh, of the job. And uh, today is the first day for school for a lot of kids. I saw signs up, you know, first day of school. And uh, yesterday was the first day of school for little Eli, our grandson and uh, for little Eric, another grandson, and for uh, Nathan, another grandson, <laughs> and uh, then our granddaughter Megan, and many others, they'll be going to school. Some are excited about it, and some are not. Uh, it was good for Nathan this year. Uh, he has uh, CP, and last year was kind of terrible. He was really uh, negative about his first day of school, and got all anxious and nervous, and feeling terrible, but uh, uh, yesterday he was good. He was positive and happy, so we're, we're, we're real relieved, and his uh, parents are relieved that that was the case with, uh, with him. I know myself, sometimes I've looked forward to going back to school, just seeing some old friends. I haven't seen them, you know, after a whole summer. And um, But then also kind of dreading it because you're losing the summer, and so you have a dread there. Uh, well, likewise with the new job, sometimes there's an excitement and sometimes there's a nervousness, a fear, uh, a dread involved, uh, uh, and uh, maybe sometimes even uh, some joy. It depends on how you vision your job and what it is. Well, what do you think about the, the kingdom of God and about what you're going to be doing uh, in it? A have you been able to coalesce any thoughts in your mind, put up? A little bit of uh, bone and flesh on the idea that one of these days you're actually going to be working. By working, I don't mean necessarily putting out a sweat uh, or pushing some paper somewhere, but you're going to be actually working in the business of governing uh, in the kingdom of God. And you're going to be under uh, the rule of God. Uh, you're going to be working for your boss is going to be God Almighty, and uh, and his appointed chief executive officer, human king of the earth, uh, is going to be Jesus Christ. Uh, pretty good bosses, I'd say, right? 
God the Father and, and Jesus Christ as your boss. And uh, you'll be working for them. Now, is that going to change anything about how you feel about your job? About the work? You say, yeah, yeah, but, but what will I be doing? Well, do we know for sure? Uh, the answer, of course, is no. Uh, we know generally you're going to be serving. That's what Jesus said. He came to serve. And so we're going to be serving. Who are we going to be serving? We're going to be serving the people on earth. What will we be serving them? Lunch? No. Uh, well, maybe, but... Uh, the disciples did a little of that work. They did a little, little waiting work too, didn't they? A little busboy work. Uh, they cleaned up the, the remnants when after they fed the people. So they did a little of that. But primarily, uh, their job was to spread the good news about uh, God's plan, about his kingdom, and about how to live a life full of goodness as opposed to full of evil. And how to eradicate uh, those things that are causing trouble in your life, out of your life. And how to uh, put a smile ear to ear on your face. How to have uh, a happy life, a good life, doing good things. And then discover the full potential, the full beauty of the human mind. And what we're capable of doing. And uh, this earth what it's capable of producing and this solar system and this cosmos and this uh, great universe that God's built well, there's going to be an awful lot to do it's big, it's huge gigantic how many uh, children how many sons and daughters will God need to help him rule well it talks about myriads of angels you know, 10,000 times 10,000 in other words, just multiples so God has a huge uh, spiritual administration already. And they're, to, they're just to aid him in the big project, which is the developing sons and daughters, uh, us, his people. That's when the explosion is going to take place. And that's when, the, as it says, the new heaven and the new earth is inaugurated. All things new. You're going to be part of that all things new. You're part of a new administration starting off on the ground floor. And uh, you'll be given some instructions. Will some of those things be worked out? Well, of course they will. You know, if you go to work in Washington, D.C., if a new administration comes into power here in a couple of years, and hopefully there will be one, uh, and you're chosen to do a job and have a part in it, uh, there's preparation that goes on. Uh, an office is, is made f for you. Uh, a job description is, is given. Assistants are are uh, lined up uh, for you, and you have uh, papers, a uh, dossier. Uh, you have uh, uh, information about what you're going to be doing, and, and specifically. And so you'll know where you're going to work, what you're going to be doing, who you're going to be working with, what your levels of responsibility are, what's expected of you, who you report to, who you supervise, and and uh, the nature of your, your work. And, uh, you know, people get in these jobs and they, they realize they're, you know, they're so big, they're so exciting and demanding and everything else, and we're just humans and we still got to sleep eight hours a day and we have time for eating and brushing teeth and cleaning and all the other kind of stuff uh, well it's going to be a little different setup once you're born anew or born again in the full sense uh, given a spiritual body as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 15 at the last trump you know this mortal puts on immortality this flesh puts on incorruptible uh, spirit uh, flesh as it were uh, then you're of a different kind, of a different energy level. And uh, as uh, John says in First John uh, 3, that we're going to be able to see God as he is in his full glory, his full power. Uh, for we shall be like him. Now it says nobody can see God and live. He's a consuming fire. In other words, there's at his spiritual realm, we, we cannot exist. But once we're made sons and daughters like him, we can. 
So there's an energy level step up <laughs> that is going to uh, open huge horizons, not only for what we are capable of doing uh, and uh, and have at our disposal the the entire operation, the entire administration of the angelic kingdom under God, and. Uh, but we're, we'll, have, we'll have a site to be able to see the, the whole cosmos of uh, the tens of billions of galaxies and everything else out there to see the big picture of what God is doing and specifically what we're about doing. And the amazing thing is that what we're going to be tasked with primarily doing, as we see from the scriptures very plainly, all the prophets, minor prophets, they tell us, is basically helping people move Godward, the people on earth. Step one, deal with them. Uh, you know, the, the, they have in the emergency room, they have triage. People come in and, and you find out immediately what's wrong with them and you solve what immediately has, has to uh, take place. If they're bleeding, they've got something broken, you know, to save their life, to do what immediately has to be done. And so there's going to be this situation for the earth. There are going to be immediate situations uh, where people need to be helped immediately, and so. But then, after that immediacy uh, need uh, subsides, uh, then there's the secondary and third, and so on. And then a long-term educational program, a development program, and a rebuilding program, and all that takes place. And it speaks of this going on for one thousand years. Now, when people have been on a job for 20 years, they're starting to get kind of, as they say, burned out, you know, whatever. Or if somebody's been on a job for 40 years, they say, oh, boy, he's had a long career in that job. Well, can you imagine a job uh, where you've been on for 1,000 years? A uh, challenging job? Well, God's going to suit the job to the person. He's the perfect uh, personnel uh, manager, you might say, that perfect match, whatever your talents and abilities are, who knows best, you or God, what your profile is, where your strengths are. Well, God does. So he's going to match you there uh, in a job doing what? Well, doing basically what you're learning to do right now with yourself. Because there's one thing you're an expert on, and that is what you know and have experienced yourself. Uh, maybe you don't know about everybody else and can't reference everybody else, but you know God, and you know what he's done for you, and you know what changes have taken place in your life and what need to take place in your life and how they've been affected. And this is where we begin with, with others. We begin sharing them, moving them, leading them to uh, the Savior of the world to the Redeemer of all mankind, to the God of all creation. And there's education involved. And, and that education takes takes time. And, uh, and that's what we'll be engaged in doing in various responsibilities, various levels. And it, uh, it's very diverse. There's going to be no jobs that are uh, dumb jobs or bad jobs or, you know, so-called dishwasher jobs. Uh, all work is going to be important because it all leads to the same end of a beautiful kingdom. Everything God does is beautiful in its in its ways. And so he's going to put together a, a beautiful kingdom. He's going to use you to do it. He's going to use me to do it. And he's got a spot for us. He wants us to fit into that spot. And what's most important to him is the quality of our character. Um, and as far as learning details and getting power and all that, he can give us that. He can give us the details, he can give us the assistance, he can give us the power. But what we have to be as ourselves, uh, we have to have that character, that love of God, that love for others, uh, that you, you don't get out of a book somewhere, you don't buy it. Uh, that has to be internally generated and that's what God's doing through his spirit in us now that's what it's all about but it's going to be a joyous time 
and uh, it's going to be a real, real happy time. And I, I said earlier, the happiest people on earth uh, should be Christians. We should be the most uh, positive, uh, the most optimistic, uh, realistic, sure, but the most optimistic because we know how it, it all turns out. And uh, the book is F and I. Have. Let's just turn there. I won't go elsewhere from just a passage in Zephaniah. Turn to chapter 3. <clears throat> this is a book about uh, the troubles and the captivities and all that Israel has uh, gone into. And uh, in the end of it all, the judgments that have uh, come upon them. And uh, uh, it's going to be brought finally to uh, to an end. And Zephaniah, the prophet, contemporary with uh, Jeremiah, uh, tells how it's going to end. So this book is a short book, three chapters. Uh, The first part of the book, it's just full of the noise of of battle, warfare, judgment, God bringing judgment, and and, it doesn't sound too good. And now we come to chapter 3, and all of a sudden, uh, the scenes change. (laughs) It's no longer the sound of uh, noise and battle and all, but it's the uh, the sound of celebration, the sound of song and joy and happiness, because something's happened, something's changed, and it's this we celebrate on this feast of trumpets, the big change that's going to happen to this earth. Well, let's pick up the story here in Zephaniah. It's one of the um, minor prophets. Minor not in scope or importance, but uh, simply in size. Uh, chapter 3, and let's read in verse 14, where it begins this positive change of scene. Sing, O daughter of Zion. It's a personifying Jerusalem having its children and so on. Shout aloud, O Israel. So it's a time of shouting and singing. I mean, this is a happy time. Happy times are here again. Whoa! Be glad and rejoice. Let's lay it on here. Uh, Glad and rejoice with all your heart. So this isn't kind of a halfway sort of a deal where you just take a you know, uh, bite ice cream and, you know, it tastes kind of good and that's about it. No, this is something where you, you're you just fully ecstatic over the kingdom of God. This is the biggest thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. The history of your life is happening. So be glad, rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. <clears throat> you children of Jerusalem. And of course we are spiritual children of Jerusalem too, aren't we? Even though the focus here is on Israelites. Yahweh has taken away your punishment. He's turned back your enemy. That's all It's all done. And has Israel had those enemies? Yes, the whole history of them. Yahweh, the King of Israel, is with you. Aren't those about the best words you could possibly hear? If God is with you, who can be against you? If God is for you, who can be against you? How do they stack up against God? They don't. You know, all he needs to do is is, is breathe on them and they're gone. Notice this. Never again will you fear any harm. Never again. That means this is the end, the cessation of fear. This is the last day of fear in the history of the world. Uh, the last day of fear in Israel's history. Now, could we get a proclamation like that now? Would anybody believe it? No. Is it coming? Yes. This day is coming. It's not here and no administration of uh, political voting uh, is going to bring it in. Uh, This is is supranatural. Uh, This is from God. On that day, 
sort of a reflexive look to this time of God's intervention. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp like you're discouraged, hang down. No, pick them up, clap. You know that. Don't be discouraged. <laughs> no more. For Yahweh your God is with you. He is mighty to save. Mighty to save. What's he want to do? He wants to save. He's not out to destroy. He's here to save. Our God is a savior. That makes a big difference, doesn't it? Certainly how you feel toward him. He will take great delight in you. So when God God takes great delight in you, that that's like a a mother or father, you know, just beaming from um, ear to ear and smile and happiness and joy and and giggling delight over a, a child that they love. He will quiet you with his love. So if you've been nervous and agitated and worried and anxious and all torn up and all that, he's going to quiet you. What better way to do that? Well, it's with his love. It's kind of like you go to some of our kids sometimes have had what they call these um, night terrors, you know, these uh, nightmares during the night. And and the, the, particularly when they're young, uh, one of our boys particularly, We'd go in there, and it was hard to kind of get him awake. He'd be kind of screaming and having this nightmare. And we'd just hold him real tight and stroke him and love him and talk softly to him. And he calms down. Next thing you know, boy, he's going back to sleep. It's gone. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. You know, like a parent holding a child in his lap, singing, calming them, rejoicing. Isn't this a beautiful picture of God and how he relates to us? How he is going to relate to the earth? Is it going to be hard to sell God to the people on this earth? If I can use terms like that, looking at it from a marketing point of view, will it be hard to market God? This kind of God to the people on earth? I don't think so. I think that's what everybody's yearning for. That kind of love, that acceptance, that quietness. That comes from a spirit of forgiveness, you know, where God's willing to forgive. Uh, the sorrows for the appointed feasts I will remove from you. This is a very complex verse here. It's it's uh, almost untranslatable. Uh, most commentaries will tell us uh, various ideas of how to translate it. Some have come down this side or that side of it. Some say, well, because, you know, Jude had been taken away and uh, captive, away from its beloved feasts, its memorable feasts, its happy feasts for so long in lands of captivity. And uh, it sorrowed and sorrowed for those times and sang its songs about those wonderful times. That's, I'm going to take away those sorrows. I'm going to remove those sorrows. I'm going to remove those burdens that have been a reproach to you as you've been in your land of captivity. It's interesting, a feast would be mentioned in that light is something that we should be sorrowing, or they were sorrowing after, and God is one of the blessings was going to remove that sorrow. Uh, and of course, we find in the book of Zechariah, the feasts are very prominent in the kingdom of God, something that's going to be reinstituted. It's part of that family affair that God is going to have on earth when he brings us all together as sons and daughters on earth. At that time I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame and gather those who have been scattered. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they've been put to shame. And I will gather you at that time and I'll bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, saith Yahweh. So this is a pretty happy time, isn't it? Uh, no matter how bad it looks now and we look at the storm clouds gathering in the Middle East uh, as they always seem to be somewhere around there gathering. 
and we don't know what the future holds here, or what year, or what this is going to happen, or how this is going to develop. You know, some of these things we just don't know. But we do know this. We do know that in the end comes the kingdom of God, and comes a time of joy and happiness, and the sun will shine, and the dead will rise, and God will reign, and there will be peace on earth, and he will comfort, and he will heal. And as it says here, and no more, never again, will there be fear. He even speaks of wiping away tears. So is when you know how things are going to turn out and how good it's going to be, can that change your view toward the future and toward God? Yes, I think it can. It can give you a residual hope in your mind. And uh, as we celebrate these festivals, let them be reminders that there is there is hope no matter what uh, the present may, may look like. And we just need to keep moving Godward. I was just noticing on this shirt I'm wearing here today. This is a shirt my wife uh, bought me, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe. I wear it all the time, but wear it out. Uh, I wear shirts out. And um, it's got a little tab on it. On the back of the shirt, it's got a, uh, a little uh, uh, sign on the back. Not a sign, but it's kind of, you know, woven in with the thread. Uh, smooth sailing. Uh, it's a pretty pretty little uh, colorful thing of sailboat, you know. But... Uh, here on their little note on the uh, on the shirt woven into it, it's a Nat uh, Nast uh, shirt on smooth sailing. I was reading this uh, this morning. Let me read it to you. It fits, I think. Some say sailing is the art of getting wet and ill while going nowhere at great expense. <laughs> well, I've heard that. In sailing, as in life, pessimists complain about the wind. Optimists expect it to change. And realists understand that while they can't change the direction, they can adjust the sails in order to reach their destination. And I think we can be both optimistic about the future and realists and know that, yes, we do need to sometimes adjust our sails as we navigate through the difficulties of this world, as the Bible tells us, overcome to the end, which means a lot of sail adjusting to the moving tides and the winds, as we move to a destination, but you have to have a destination. And our destination is very clear. And Jesus said it for us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be yours well with that we conclude our messages here today and we will have a closing prayer and I'll ask uh, uh, brother Doug Ward to lead us in prayer and then we'll have a closing song from Roger uh, Bryant and do remember him and his family with the loss of his wife Lana Jane here this last uh, week. Uh, Doug, could you lead us in a closing prayer? Mm -hmm. Sure can. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we're living in an, an anxious time with lots of strife and, and problems. Thank you for bringing us back to help us see the
much for uh, for all you have uh, set before us. And uh, we ask this in Jesus' name, in the name of our soon coming King. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and this is from the Elijah uh, Felix Mendelssohn uh, When the Righteous Shine Forth. Roger Bryant soloist Lana Jane at the piano see you Saturday then then shall the right to shine forth as the sun in the heavenly Father's realm Shine forth as the sun In the heavenly Father's realm Then shall the righteous shine forth In the heavenly Father's realm As the sun Sure. 